Hello everyone, K Dub here, and in this episode of Yep, yeah, excuse me. In this episode of Buddhism two hundred, we are going to look at perspectives on abortion. Yay! So a very hot topic, right? Where um there you know, there's there's the pro life and then there's the pro choice, and then there are those of us in the middle that are like, Hey, don't get us in you don't get us stuck in this war, please. Uh, so we're going to look at some perspectives on abortion from a Buddhist perspective. And actually, it's a pretty clear-cut perspective. Um, but at the same time, there are those who are going to say that, yes, this is a clear-cut perspective, but what about these sort of special circumstances? And we're going to cover that a little bit. Uh, so we do have the agenda. It's up there uh, underneath the word K-dub. Uh, so we're going to talk about when does human life begin from a Buddhist perspective. Does abortion count as murder? Good question. Uh, should we favor those who decide to see the pregnancy through? That should be a pretty clear-cut answer if you know some of the basics of Buddhism. And is there an element of choice when it comes to having an abortion from a Buddhist perspective? Uh, and we're going to be drawing from two sort of sources. We're going to be drawing from a blog post, which was talking about Roe versus Wade. And the bishop actually um, had a situation where his wife... Uh, was not able to come to term with a pregnancy, so a stillborn sort of uh, situation, and had to have an abortion service uh, completed because it was going to harm her more than likely, and so they had the procedure done. Uh, so we're going to have that perspective, and we're also going to have a perspective from a more academic view by Philip A. Lesko, and uh, so we're gonna, that's going to try and cover all these bases. So when does human life begin? This is something that Lesko talks about in his 1987 article, uh, which is very simply called A Buddhist View on Abortion. And uh, something that Lesko touches on is that there's no text that says that abortion is right or wrong necessarily, um, but it's implied. Um, it's implicit. Uh, so one has to extrapolate from the teachings the ethical sort of position uh, that Buddhism would take on this. And to sort of touch on that, he shares the viewpoint of Roshi Philip uh, Kap Leo, uh, a teacher of the Japanese Zen tradition, uh, who stated that abortion is a grave matter, but there is no absolute right or wrong, no clear-cut solution, which is sort of confusing as someone who follows a more traditional sort of sect of Buddhism. It's it, it's yeah, there are complications, but there is a pretty clear-cut viewpoint. Uh, but that clear-cut viewpoint sort of shows up in a position paper for the Buddhist Churches of America. At that time, that stated that abortion is the taking of a human life and is therefore fundamentally wrong and must be rejected by Buddhists. We'll see something very interesting later on in that position paper. And so, the basically to answer the question, from the moment of conception on, a fetus, embryo, whatever you want to call it, is already a human being. Why? Because at conception, the life continuum consciousness is established within that zygote. It, when it becomes a zygote. What is it at conception? I think it's a zygote, but I'm not really 100% sure. It's been a while since I've taken developmental psychology. Uh, but that sort of process of rebirth has taken place, and the life continuum consciousness is already established there in that particular zygote, or whatever you want to call it. It's not a baby yet. A baby is when it pops out, uh, at least from a developmental uh, psychology viewpoint. I believe it starts out zygote, fetus, embryo, be baby. Um, but don't quote me on it. All right, so, but Lesko says, look, look. We, sometimes we look at the central nervous system as sort of a turning point when uh, this embryo gets its sort of human rights uh, from a developmental psychology perspective, you know, consciousness is fully functional because the brain is fully developed. And uh, Lesko says that doesn't really change very much. Um, once conception starts, the hard stance is that the process of human life has begun. And therefore, to have 
an abortion, even early stages, is indeed intentional killing, which is against the first precept. I abstain from intentionally killing living beings. And let's go says, okay, look, yes, I understand. Developmentally, there are differences. But the quantitative differences in functionality of a fetus as it grows carries zero more moral weight in argumentation concerning the topic of abortion. And so, from Lesko's point of view, developmentally speaking, those arguments are mute because, uh, not mute, moot. They are moot uh, because we've already established that the process of human life starts at conception. And Lesko shares the viewpoint of a Mary Meehan, who states that there are many arguments put forth in defense of abortion that appear to be guided by social social political goals rather than scientific interest. And if you think about the science of develop, development in the process of human life, you can use the science either way if, uh, if uh, you are able to think through it logically. And so I, I've, used, I've used the scientific view to support my own sort of position. Um, and now that I think about it, that's probably uh, extremely, extremely flawed. Um, but it's sort of just a personal belief, um, not necessarily something that I would legislate. Uh, so when does human life begin? That process begins at conception. Therefore, we have to ask the question, does abortion then count as murder? Well, the murder from a legal sense is a human being killing another human being. And so then the question becomes, is a zygote a human being from a legal perspective? And I would argue that probably from a legal perspective, no, but from a moral and ethical position, you could say yes. And therefore, if you are ruled by your morals and ethics, that would be the standpoint that I would suggest that be, be taken. If you're more of someone who says, well, I, my, <clears throat> my view is not as is not as strong in the moral and ethical sort of guidelines. It's more of that along with what's legal. Uh, then the perspective would be different. Um, but from a Buddhist perspective, it would be counted as intentionally killing a living being. Uh, therefore, it would sort of count as murder. Uh, however, I I also would it, this would be incomplete if I didn't bring up special circumstances. So. Those special circumstances do require some additional consideration. Think about it. When Let's say that I'm a utilitarian from an ethical viewpoint. If I have, ha, do not ha, take all the information in consideration before I make a decision, it may not be an ethical decision. So we do have to take some of these special considerations into account when we make a decision, such as birth defects. What if... Big question, you know, what if there are birth defects that reduce the lifespan of that particular embryo after it is born? Say it's say 11 years or less. Or quality of life, going to be in pain. It's whole lo- the, the being's whole life going to be in pain. These are all things we got to take into consideration from a sort of Buddhist standpoint. I know there are some that I say it's absolute and it's universal. I technically don't really believe in a lot of universals other than, you know, not murdering and stuff like that. That's pretty universal. Um, but in this situation, I don't believe that there is a universal to sort of uh, lay on. Yes, the Buddhist fam- standpoint is extremely clear cut. Um, but once you throw some additional information in there, it starts becoming blurry and muddy the water a little bit. And then we have to ask, you know, what if both lives hang in the balance, the embryo's life and the woman's life? And what if both of them could be lost if the pregnancy goes to term? And once again, that's probabilistic. Um, But there are certain situations where it may be highly probable that both will end up dying. And I'm sure there are those that believe that that does not matter. For me and my personal perspective, and somewhat from a Buddhist perspective, that is something that needs to be taken into consideration. All right, so that takes care of, does it count as murder? Certainly. And um, this sort of brings me to sort of what the bishop, uh, Bishop Marvin Harada says, in Roe vs. Wade, a personal experience with abortion 
which was uh, posted online July 5th of 2022. Um, the bishop sort of went through a circumstance where his wife needed abortion services because there was a stillborn within uh, her reproductive system. And to keep the stillborn in there until basically it came out would have had severe consequences. And so they were, the bishop and his wife were sort of stuck in, yeah, well, what do we do about this? Um, and so they did have the abortion service uh, completed. And as a result, uh, they were able to have two children later on. Um, and it's unknown whether that would have been able to happen if they had just sort of let nature do its thing, so to speak, um, with that stillborn. Um, but uh, the bishop does touch on, you know, should we show any favoritism and says, I should be able to talk with and counsel both the person who has decided to have the abortion and the person who has decided to have the child without judging them either way. Mostly because we're not a fully enlightened being. J passing judgment is not something that actually helps us to get toward the goal. We can discriminate to a certain point, say, this person is wise, I'd like to hang out with them. This person is unwise, I don't want to hang out with them. Uh, because they're not going to help me reach the goal, for example. Um, but not judging them. We're not saying, look, you're a bad person because you go out and you, you drink until you get drunk on the weekends. That's not what we're saying. We're saying, well, you know, the fifth precept is to abstain from intoxicants. I would sort of like to surround myself with people who don't in, indulge in intoxicants, which is difficult in some circumstances. Um, so it's not really... It's not really that I think it's your bad person. It's just uh, for my individual practice, it's better if I hang around people that are sober, um, ev even on weekends. Um, so it's not really judging. It's sort of discriminating who we want to be close to and who we want to sort of be friendly and sort of keep some distance uh, with because of some choices that they make, which may lead us in a different direction, not necessarily the path we want to go to. Uh, so uh, the argument there is that whether it's a person who says, I want to have an abortion or a person who says, I'm going to have this, I'm going to have this uh, pregnancy go to term, uh, neither should be judged one way or the other, at least uh, from this perspective. And uh, that sort of comes to the element of choice. And uh, there are a couple things um, that are brought up in this certain literature. Um, and I am not sure if Lesko was trying to throw a right hook here against fundamental Christianity, but um, we can sort of determine that after I read it. Thus, it is clear that Buddhism has a pro-life position on abortion. However, unlike many fundamentalist Christian positions, Buddhism does not agree with attempts to legislate individual morality. It is recognized that we live in a pluralistic world and society in which toleration of divergent views is encouraged. So I'm pretty sure that this was... I, I, I'm pretty sure that this is a jab. Um, but at the same time, it does make a certain point that is relatively true. Uh, from a Buddhist perspective, a pluralistic world and society is a pluralistic world and society. And it's not our responsibility to make others conform to what we believe. Uh, there is freedom to be different in the in that sort of viewpoint, and those divergent views actually, I think, enrich society as and does not work against society because that challenge allows us to grow as people if we allow it to. Uh, the divi divergent views allow us to maybe not necessarily change our views. Sometimes it will, um, but to reinforce why we believe what we believe as well as respecting and maybe even um, and maybe even showing admiration for other viewpoints, even though we don't necessarily agree with them. Um, so because we have this sort of pluralistic world in society, um, the Buddhist Churches of America have a standpoint, and this was written during Lesko's time in 1987 when this was published, 
Although others may be involved in the decision-making, it is the women carrying the fetus and no one else, who must in the end make this diff most difficult decision and live with it the rest of her life. As Buddhists, we can only encourage her to make a decision that is both thoughtful and compassionate. And I think that's sort of in alignment uh, with what the, the teachings are. Uh, because it's it's said in the Dhammapada that the, that the Buddhas only point the way we have to walk the path. And so that's our version of doing that, which is, this is our viewpoint. This is a violation of first precept. According to our viewpoint, it's still your choice. Are you willing to take the karmic consequences? Because murder is murder, even in self-defense, and there has to be some sort of consequence. And so that's why the law of karma is impartial. Um, it, it doesn't care if it's self-defense or if it is an intentional murder. There are going to be consequences. The intensity of the consequences may be different, but there are going to be consequences. Uh, and also, um, the bishop, uh, Marvin Harada, also s sort of talks about this when it comes to choice. Uh, and the first sort of blurb is about a person's karma. So uh, the bishop says, But every person's karma is unique, and it is not for me to say how a person should live their life. We all have to face moral and ethical choices in our life. Buddhism is unique in that it does not categorically say what we should and shouldn't do in black and white terms. The strength of Buddhism lies in the gray area in between. The teachings give us the foundation to make some of life's most difficult decisions and then to live with that decision. So we can make a decision that goes against the precepts. So I could say, well, there's an ant in my house or in my apartment here. I'm going to squish it. That's an intentional de destroying of living beings. But when I think about that, I'm like, am I willing to take the karmic consequences? Sure, I don't like ants. Um, so that's sort of out of ill will, so it's a double whammy. Not only is it intentionally destroying a living being, it's also done out of ill will. So whatever those consequences are, they're probably not going to be very awesome. Uh, but uh, I, at that point, the decision was, don't really care. Let's just squash this ant. Uh, so, he, he and then the bishop makes a really good point here, I think. Morality and ethics change with time. Laws and po politics change with time as well. Amidst this often chaotic world that we live in, we must find the true and real, the timeless, the truth of the Buddha Dharma that transcends morality and ethics that transcends secular law and governments, that is the foundation for our life and spiritually guides us in the choices in life that we must sometimes make. And I think this is a very good point, and it really touches on that, you know, show the path, but they need to walk it sort of way. It's not saying we need to hold governments to the standards of the Buddha Dharma. We need to hold secular law to the standards of the Buddha, the Buddha Dharma. We do... We do not need to make sure that all individuals follow the Buddha Dharma. That is not in that particular situation. It says us. And by us, it sort of means human beings in general. But you could also see it as more specifically practicing Buddhists. So finding that true Buddha Dharma, which is very difficult unless you're a monk, because as a lay person, you have a lot of distractions. And so... Um, when I think of, you know, the Buddha Dharma now, I think of not necessarily study, but putting it into practice and trying that to the best of my ability, being compassionate, following the, the five precepts to the best of my ability. <clears throat> and that's sort of like the lay person's way of trying to find that sort of timeless, true and real Buddha Dharma, because it's very difficult unless you're a monk. And if rebirth is, a, is something that does occur, then maybe in the next life, or the life after that, that can be found. Um, but not relying on that possibility, necessarily. Still taking steps as a layperson to sort of try and find that as best we can. Um, but when it relates to abortion, basically this, it, my interpretation of this would be, we need to look through a Buddha Dharma sort of lens, and use that as a foundation to guide our decisions, whether it's life decisions or spiritual decisions that we need to make. And sometimes those are very difficult choices. 
And so having that lens there while making that choice, but not necessarily saying that, hey, you know, if you uh, if you violate the first precept, you're a bad person. That's um, not necessarily what is being said there. We can use that first precept as a lens in which to view choices. So am I a bad person for stomping a mouse that I found in here uh, a while back? I felt like a terrible person when that happened. But at the same time, after that happened, I sort of re-engage myself in the practice. So it may not make up for it, but it's still a process of self-improvement. So just to sort of summarize, uh, when does human life begin from a Buddhist perspective at conception? Because uh, the relinking consciousness comes into the next life, and then the life continuum consciousness kicks on, and therefore we have consciousness at that point, even if it's only a zygote. Uh, does abortion count as murder? According to the first precept, it would count as intentional killing of a living being. So technically, yes. But there are special considerations that need to be taken into account, such as, uh, will the fetus come to term and be able to have a long life? Or a life where the quality of life is not being in pain for as long as the uh, being is alive? Uh, should we favor those who decide to see the pregnancy through? Technically, absolutely not. That is being biased. Impartiality means that we treat those people relatively the same. Which is very difficult as a human being, mind you. And is there an element of choice? Absolutely. There may be other people that assist in making that choice. But the woman who is carrying the fetus, embryo, zygote, whatever it may be, whatever developmental stage it is at... They are the one that makes that ultimate choice and lives with the consequences of that choice. Therefore, there is an element of choice from a Buddhist perspective. It's still a violation of the first precept, and there is gonna, there are going to be karmic consequences. Uh, but at the same time, it is a choice to be made, and that woman makes that choice. All right, so I think that this sort of talk really goes into another topic that I'm not going to talk for over 20 minutes about, uh, which is, was the Buddha concerned about the liberation of all beings? Is that some, was that part of the goal, is sort of the question. All right, everyone, so until the next discussion, take care of yourselves, and I'll talk to you soon. Goodbye for now.